Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, next presenter is uh, Professor Daniel Cox from UC Davis. The title of the talk is Alternative Approaches to Photovoltaics 2, Beating the Limits with Multiple or Hot Carriers. Okay, thank you. Okay, apologies for uh, being late. Uh, the reason I picked these topics uh, with Elon Osmi to come is not in my research area, it's because ICAM is interested in energy and because um, this area of energy does, this area of photovoltaics is basically not covered in the upcoming meeting which focuses on organic photovoltaics. So, um, the basic idea comes from uh, Michael Bratzel, uh, who is a professor of chemistry at EPFL in Lausanne, and he wrote his original paper on this subject in 1991, and since that time you can see he's had an incredibly growing number of citations per year on this work such that he's actually gotten some 63,000 citations. He's one of the most cited chemists uh, in the world. And the notion was to basically find uh, stable analogs to photosynthetic dyes for the conversion of uh, sunlight into electricity. Uh, and those are called dye-sensitized solar cells, or DSCs, uh, for short. And I think it remains a promising idea, although uh, his original paper actually achieved the highest efficiency of light conversion to uh, photo current of any uh, subsequent paper. <laughs> um, the Gratzel dye, the original Gratzel dye molecule is this. It's a ruthenium uh, dye surrounded by these uh, nitrogen carbon rings, a three dimensional dye structure. And then it has a moiety which will attach to, uh, for example, a semiconductor like titanium oxide. And, uh, there's some similarity between this and chlorophyll, which is shown here. In chlorophyll, the absorption happens in these porphyrin rings. The photon is absorbed here, and the resulting separation of the electron and uh, hole uh, initiates the process of uh, production of, of sugar and storing of energy in the plant that way. Um, the, the chlorophyll molecule, is, uh, as an absorber of photons, is unstable outside of the, the plant. So therefore, the Gratzel cell uh, is, is an advance in this, in this direction. It was motivated by this, but there's a lot of incredible, thoughtful work that went into picking this particular dye complex and picking the semiconductor substrate that went with it. And so in a little more detail, the original cell consisted of uh, colloidal or nanoscale titanium oxide particles. The dye molecules are absorbed on top of those titanium oxide nanoparticles, and the whole nanoparticle dye complex is in contact with this uh, glass uh, electrode. Uh, on the other side is a platinum coated glass electrode in this electrolytic solution, and the electrons come off of there, uh, splitting iodine uh, from triiodide, and then the, uh, the iodine can recharge the, uh, the dye molecules, uh, and therefore set it back up for, again, an emission. And this is a, a picture of what one of his complexes looks like under illumination. I like. And he came to this design combination after exhaustively studying possible dyes and substrates. And the initial performance uh, of this was about 10% efficiency of light to, to, like, to photovoltaic uh, current. Uh, and the cost estimates were about one quarter of conventional photovoltaics at the time. But the other point about this is that essentially every component of this device can be generated with low temperature processing. And there's really no toxic components in here. For example, the titanium oxide uh, nanoparticles. Titanium oxide is very abundant. Uh, it's used in paints. It's used in um, uh, uh, sun creams, I believe. And uh, so it's, it's non-toxic. And uh, so, so that's another advantage that the overall potential contribution as a green energy device is better than uh, silicon-based photovoltaics. And in a little more detail, um, part of the, the great amount of work that went into choosing this combination is, is hinted at here. So uh, this is the, the titanium oxide nanoparticle layer connected to the electrode. This is the counter electrode. And one of the key things was that when you photo excite the dye molecule to create the, um, the excited state complex, you want the electron to be above the valence band edge of the titanium oxide nanocells. The valence band edge of the tiny titanium oxide nanocells expressed in terms of these um, electrode voltages here, that that 
sits right here. Notice that these have a minus sign. It's because you should multiply by a minus the electron charge to convert it into an energy. So if you multiply these, these by a minus sign, you'll see that the, the energy of the excited state is above the titanium oxide valence band edge, so that you should be able to inject electrons into the titanium oxide valence band. Um, that electron injection happens apparently very fast. The overall excitation time here is not as fast, but the injection process, once you create this excited state, is of the order of femtoseconds, and that, that's a, a key to the stability of the dye molecules in a repeated operation of the, the solar cell. And then in addition, you have to choose the appropriate um, anionic carrier to get the electrons back to uh, the dye molecules to recharge it. And that was in, involved the choice of these triiodide, uh, uh, triiodide ions, off which you can split um, I minus to interact with the dye. Uh, you had to choose also nanoparticle titanium oxide in order to improve the surface to volume ratio for the dyes. If you just put down a thin film of titanium oxide, you, would, you wouldn't get enough uh, dye to absorb efficiently, to absorb the, the photovoltaic energy efficiently. Um, okay, so this is all to improve the surface, the surface to volume ratio. Okay. Um, now this is a little bit about the time scales. In photosynthesis, what happens is that the recombination of the electron hole pair uh, on the um, chlorophyll is about six orders of magnitude slower than the separation uh, time. So basically, uh, if you can if you play the same game as photosynthesis, you've got a chance of, of making things work. And this is from a, a, a later paper by Boschlow and Hegfeld, primarily devoted to the chemistry of the triiodide reaction over here, which I'll say a little bit more about in a second. But uh, basically, so the, the time it takes to, to do this excitation is somewhere in the, the picosecond range. The injection time, actually, once you get it excited, can be in the, uh, the range of femtoseconds. To recombine, if you're in these excited state complex of the dye, to recombine is in the, the 20 nanosecond time range. And so the uh, uh, you've got a order of uh, let's see. When you got you got several orders of magnitude then, of the order of four orders of magnitude between the excitation energy and the recombination energy, just uh, in analog with the photosynthesis. Once you decay the electron, the excited state carrier down to the to the valence band edge of the titanium oxide, that electron has some chance of going from the titanium oxide back to the dye. Uh, that's this process, uh, which is also quite slow. Uh, by comparison to this process. And there's also the possibility on a much slower time scale of that electron combining with the iodine uh, to, to, uh, look to, to mess up this redox reaction that will recharge the dye molecule. But the key thing is that these recombination times are very slow compared to the basic excitation time. And the, the, the primary redox scheme that allows the iodine to recharge the the dye is um, you, you first excite the dye, separate the charge off into the titanium oxide. That dye then can couple to an iodine, which produces this dye iodine complex. When that couples to another iodine, you can split off the two iodines, grabbing one electron uh, for the dye to, to recharge it uh, to neutral. And then you, you pick off the, the uh, negative uh, I2. The negative I2. When you get two of those together, it will form I3 minus plus I minus, and then you can restart the, uh, the, the process because it's the I3 splitting off of the I minus from the I3 minus that gets things going. Okay, so um, a little bit about how to improve these, these Gratzel cells, how to improve the, the efficiency. So Gratzel already did quite well. His original dye is basically this N3 dye right here. Um, and that looks again like this, this ruthenium complex with these, uh, these nitrogen and carbon rings surrounding it. Uh, so that's the N3 dye. And that gives, uh, this is not quite the absorption spectrum, sorry. This is actually the photocurrent spectrum. If you measure the photocurrent generated at different photon energies, this is the, the, uh, the percentage of the maximum, maximum photocurrent that you get out at these different photon frequencies. But basically things cut off up at about 800 nanometers. If you get up to about 800 nanometers, you're not picking off uh, much energy for the photocurrent then. Uh, this is a different dye, so-called black dye, which is also ruthenium-based. And the ruthenium-based black dye uh, is 
is, is similar chemically, but looks, you know, as you can see, just a little bit different. And uh, that one has a absorption spectrum that goes all the way out to this edge of about 900 nanometers. Now, uh, Gratzel places great stress in his recent work on trying to get, you know, past this 900 nanometer edge. And it's basically because if you look at the solar spectrum, 900 nanometers will, will cover a large part of this infrared energy in the solar spectrum, which otherwise is missed by, by these other dyes, which capture very well in the visible part of the spectrum, but then miss a large part of the infrared. A large part of the solar spectrum, of course, is residing over here in the, in the infrared. So uh, by merely doing an extension up to this 900 nanometer edge, you can basically get about a 5% increase in efficiency to your photovoltaics without any change in the electrolytic properties of the cell, without doing anything to, to, the, to the electrolyte or anything inside the cell. Another way that you can try to improve this is you can use combinations of dyes with overlapping spectra. So one dye might be good here, one dye might be good here, one dye might be good here, and you can try to improve the efficiency that way. And there's been some work along those lines, which I guess is promising. Yeah. Now, when you say five percent, do you mean do you mean five percent or ten percent? Uh, ten percent to fifteen percent. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah. So pretty significant. Yeah. Not not ten point five percent. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be less interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This, the hope is to get up to 15%, which would be pretty, pretty darn good, yeah. Okay. Uh, and another concern is that the basic Gratzel dye is an organometallic dye with ruthenium, which is not exactly a common um, element. So it would be nice if you could find a way to replace the, um, the, the ruthenium-based dye with some other dyes, which are naturally occurring. For example, dyes based on coumarin. And one thing I learned about from an ICAM, well, as an ICAM director, I went to a workshop in Nigeria three years ago. There's actually a group in Tanzania that's trying to do research on natural dyes in plants in Tanzania to find suitable candidates for dye sensitized solar cells, which is kind of nice. It's, it's a pretty intriguing project. This is work done by a, a group in Japan uh, working with coumarin dyes. They've done a lot of work on this. And it, this is basically that same kind of uh, photocurrent versus wavelength uh, efficiency efficiency of conversion at different wavelengths, photocurrent versus uh, wavelength efficiency for uh, several different dyes, all of which are derivatives of coumarin. And coumarin is a, is a natural dye which you can find, for example, in uh, tonka bean and various grasses. Uh, the best that they've been able to do with these coumarin-based dyes, and everything else being essentially the same as the original Gratzel cell, is to get up to about 7.7% efficiency. The original Gratzel cell got up to 10% efficiency, so th this is pretty good. Um, and again, if you can if you can get it from plant-based dyes, obviously uh, they're going to be abundant. They're going to be uh, regeneratable. Uh, they're purely organic, and uh, so there's a lot of uh, desirable aspects to, to being able to extract the dye process, the dye from this. One of the real concerns with the Gratzel cells is about about stability. Um, and that has more to do with the electrolyte. I mean, when you put a silicon-based photovoltaic on top of your rooftop, it's completely solid state. It'll last for 20 to 40 years, something like that. You don't have to do anything to it. It stays up there. It, it, it's good. You may have to clean it some, but as long as you don't hit it with a hammer or, or have, uh, you know, what, you've got to keep uh, dielectric material from birds off of it and so on. Uh, but as long as you do that, it's, it's, a good, it's a good photovoltaic that will last for a long time. But if you have something which has a, a fluid between two glass plates, you can start to worry about that. And so there's been a direction to try to move towards solid state based Gratzel cells, uh, with sort of solid state electrolytes, or something in between, which, for example, could be a gel, polymer gel. And um, this, is a, this is a promising development uh, a few years back from Gratzel himself with a polymer gel. Uh, the dyes themselves don't appear to be a problem. Uh, Early on, Gratzel noticed that his original dye is basically stable for 10 to the 8th recharges. Um, if you think about the fact that, uh, uh, you know, there's, I mean, well, that would correspond uh, on the average when you take into account the electron transit times to get back here, that would correspond on the average to about a 20 year period for um, the, uh, the lifetime of a particular individual dye molecule. And as he stresses, uh, the, region, the reason that these things uh, last pretty well is because you get the electrons out of there quickly into the titanium oxide, uh, apparently. Uh, that, that's the claim. Uh, let's see. So what he did uh, after his original work was he came to a polymer gel electrolyte um, to stabilize his cells. 
The iodine is still free to move between the strands of the polymer gel uh, inside the, the, uh, the material. And the ruthenium dye is a little bit different than the original one he used. But uh, the, the nice thing here is that when he looked at the, uh, electro the, the, the um, electrochemistry aspects of the iodine conversion, uh, the solid line is the liquid that he used in his original cell. The, di the dotted line is the gel that he used in his original cell. There's no difference at all between the iodine performance inside the gel-based uh, cell. But the stability of this gel-based cell is really quite good, at least on a time scale of 1,000 hours. Essentially, if you look at the, um, the photo current, the maximum photo current, under illumination at 55 degrees Celsius with one solar constant of illumination, you, you, you're hard pressed to find any degradation at all between either the liquid here or the gel. And the gel is going to have more favorable characteristics when you put it out into the environment. So, um, as he said in his paper, that this suggests that, that there should be a lot of work to go on and uh, trying to find these more stable um, uh, photovoltaics to put on in the environment. Okay, so that's uh, that's what I wanted to tell you as a sort of a survey of the, the Grazel cell. And uh, the, uh, the other idea that one can borrow from nature is the solar generation of fuel. And per the discussion yesterday, um, one of the things you want in transportation is you want to get the maximum range in transportation. Um, battery cars basically aren't going to get you there right now. The Nissan Leaf that I mentioned yesterday can get you a range of about 100 miles on a full charge. And then uh, at the moment, those, those cars take a long time to charge up. Um, there's some hope that one can speed up the charging time, but at the moment, the charging time can be uh, several hours for, for, for electric cars. The Tesla car is claiming that they can go uh, maybe up to 200 or 300 miles on a charge, um, but uh, uh, that's under sort of ideal driving conditions. And um, it's, you know, it's again, uh, the nice thing about a fuel-based car for transportation is you can go a long ways um, based on the fuel. So it seems to me, at least in some interim, until we get very much improved batteries, we need to have some fuel to, to run cars. And that would be either for fuel cells or for internal combustion engines. Um, and Nate Lewis and uh, Daniel Nocera at MIT, and actually um, Daniel Nocera gave a talk at Davis recently, which we have on the ICAM, um, the ICAM website. In fact, uh, we have a channel which uh, they're putting up the, the, the DVDs, or sorry, they're putting up the, the tapes from here on this uh, channel on SciV. So if you go to uh, SciV.tv and you look on the <coughs> ICAM, Bid, you can find uh, uh, Nocera's recent lecture uh, that he gave at Davis on uh, personal uh, energy generation. And what he had in mind was exactly this solar fuel generation, where you generate the hydrogen as a fuel for your car directly from sunlight at your house on these appropriate devices. Um, and so this is just borrowing from the work of Lewis and Nocera. But basically, uh, the idea is, of course, on a fuel cell, what you do is you pump in hydrogen at the anode, you pump in oxygen at the electrode, you get the protons to go across and combine with the oxygen to produce water and release energy. But if you can run in reverse by using photons to split the water uh, here, then you could, uh, you could wind up putting water into your uh, photoelectrolysis cell, use sunlight to split the water, pump out H2 on one side and O2 uh, on the other side. And that's, uh, that's what they're hoping to, to come up with. Um, and they, they have an example where they can get about 10 to 18% efficiency uh, in the laboratory uh, for doing this. But the reason why I think it's sort of bio-inspired is because we know of things that do this in nature. For example, Photosystem 2 uh, is a complex of photosynthesis which is a very complicated complex. At its core, it has a uh, set of four manganese ions. And those four manganese ions at the core of photosystem two basically split water into oxygen, uh, electrons, and, and protons. Um, and then uh, hydrogenase can take uh, and split, uh, can basically hydrogenase can take protons plus electrons and generate um, hydrogen gas out of those. So the combination of the hydrogenase uh, uh, enzyme, which is, uh, for example, in this, uh, this cell right here, 
And the photosystem two um, enzyme in in the uh, in plants using photosynthesis for the spraying of water. The combination of these two uh, catalysts can be used for producing um, hydrogen from from sunlight. Okay, and. Uh, Another nano approach for getting energy from the sun, which again won't be discussed here, another two sets of nano approaches, are uh, basically go after, depend upon going after the current and going after special properties of nanoscale structures which might allow this, um, this possibility to emerge. Uh, namely, um, you can increase the photo current. If you look at this, you can't do a thing to the charge, basically. But what you can do is you can try to increase the carrier density or you can try to increase the carrier speed. Um, now, how can you increase the carrier density? Well, more about that on the next slide, but you can, you can generate more than one carrier per photon, and that will increase the carrier density. The way that you can increase the carrier speed, in principle, is you can get hot electrons generated in your photovoltaic devices, so that when you excite the electron from the, uh, into the valence band from the conduction band, if you can get those electrons uh, well above the edge of the valence band and get them out before they emit phonons to decay, then you can get uh, you can get higher current densities out. So you, you basically excite it well above, you excite the electron well above and potentially excite the hole well below. And the hope would be that you can get those out before you couple the phonons and decay back down. And therefore, by having a higher uh, initial velocity, then you're going to get a higher current out of your device. Now, in practice, um, nobody's done this. In practice, people have tried this, but nobody's succeeded. But there is a paper recently by some people who have actually been involved in ICANN-related uh, work where they show that if you take silicon uh, NP junctions and bend them down to the nanoscale, this possibility looks like it might, might emerge uh, down on the nanoscale. So at the nanoscale, there might be a possibility of basically avoiding the, uh, the phonon emission trap uh, and therefore getting hot carrier um, uh, photovoltaics out. But there's, there's, real, there's nobody who succeeded in doing this, and you can find quite few papers on the, on the subject, but the idea remains out there. The other way to get at it is through multiple carrier generation, and that probably involves uh, OJ processes. If it truly exists, there remains probably some controversy about that. But the OJ process is you create the particle-hole pair, and then through a Coulomb interaction, say, of this electron, you generate another particle-hole pair on top of it. Um, and so the idea is that you can have two holes and two carriers generated by a single photon. But in order for this to happen, you have to be able to create these, uh, this extra particle hole pair quickly before the photon decay comes in. And again, that appears to be more possible in nanostructures than in um, bulk devices. Uh, so the problem in each case with these hot carriers or with the, the multiple particle hole pairs is to get them out of the nanostructures in order to get a current. And again, nobody's really done that. But in the case of this multiple particle hole pair generation, Thanks to work by Klimov, there's been an enormous amount of effort to try to, to go after this, uh, this problem. And he, Klimov has a nice review in uh, J. Kim Fizz uh, B. Um, so uh, basically, the, the motivation goes back to 1995, where Kiesner, who did the original work with Shockley on estimating the efficiency of uh, particle hole pair, sorry, the efficiency of photovoltaics based upon single particle hole pair generation. He then looked at what happens with his collaborators. He looked at what happens if you generate two, three, all the way up to 10 particle hole pairs. And he looked at the efficiency as a function of the fundamental band gap of the semiconductor. And what you can see is that, um, you know, here's the, basically the original shockley keystone result, which peaks up at about 30%. But if you go to two particle hole uh, pairs, you already got to about 40%. And you sort of tend to saturate with a band gap of about 1 eV, you tend to saturate at about uh, 44 or 45%. But in other words, you could almost, uh, you could by, by a factor of 50%, increase the efficiency in principle by going to uh, multiple particle hole pairs. And certainly going to even just two uh, carriers, that is two particle hole pairs generated in the process, you can get an increase on the order of 30% for the efficiency. Uh, the other thing is that to be able to uh, obtain these maximum, to, to be able to obtain these optimum in the efficiency, it helps to work on the nanoscale because then by tuning the particle size, you can tune the band gap. Uh, so you might have a, a low band gap bulk material, which through quantum confinement, you tune the band gap up uh, by quantum confinement to a smaller size. So you also have some control over the band gap by going to the, uh, by going to the nanoscale. 
Recently, uh, Manasakis uh, spoke about this at the ICANN uh, annual conference in um, Davis in January, but he, he suggests that one should actually look at uh, lot uh, and charge transfer insulators, like the, the cuprate superconductors as an example in their insulating phase of being a charge transfer insulator. That you might be able to, in, in those systems, uh, just using the, the strong local Coulomb interactions, be able to beat this, uh, this phonon decay limit and generate these multiple part bubble pairs. Uh, so that opens up a new avenue uh, where you might look at metal oxides and, and their, their related compounds in order to go after photovoltaics. It's not something anybody's really done before. Um, okay, so basically that's uh, just a quick survey of, of these items which fills in um, a little bit of a gap between um, what's being covered in the CM OPV and um, uh, gives you some ideas about some other interesting things that are going on in photovoltaics. But uh, I'll be happy to talk or discuss or take a few questions in. Yes. Um, so in, term, in terms of um, theory, as both of you know theorists, um, what, what kind of, do you need to describe kind of the more insulated out of the phone versus as well to understand what's going to be good there? Yeah. Um, and where are people at? Well, so, I mean, he just did back and up all the calculations in the paper. So obviously, you probably want to combine the expertise of someone like Warren Pickett, who can do those phone on calculations, with uh, the expertise, say, of, of um, you know, Gabi Kotlihauer or uh, Sergei Sabrasov who can do the calculations of the Hubbard model aspects. But you'd want to do something realistic, yeah, because these were just back the envelope calculations, assuming something simple for the electron phonon coupling in, in these materials. But it did look like you could get time using U values uh, or charge transfer gap values that were reasonable for these materials. So it looked like, at least in principle, you could beat the, the, the phonon uh, decay limit. So anyway, I, I have a copy of the paper if you're interested in it. But it, you know, it's, it, I think it's an interesting idea. It'd be nice if we could, if we could use oxides for, for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Question at the back. Yeah, um, these dice are like the whole system. What's the like, average lifetime for dice? Oh, well, you know, so that's, uh, let me see. I don't think he's done, I mean, in principle, I guess we could have had them running for 20 years because he, he made his first ones, you know, 20 years ago, but I don't think anybody's put them in. So the kinds of tests that are done, as I showed you, are ones like this. Um, where they ran it for a thousand, he ran it for a thousand hours, which, of course, um, you know, gets us up to uh, a month. So he's, he ran it steadily under sunlight for a month. And at most he saw probably, well this one shows essentially no degradation in the current, but at most in some of the parameters he saw about a 5% degradation. Um, now that's obviously, you know, that's, a month is not 20 years, <laughs> but, but at least it's, it's promising. Uh, and there's been similar studies on the Coomerin dyes, uh, the Coomerin dye based ones, those aren't as stable, but, but there's been similar studies by the Japanese on that. So as far as I know, this is the most that anybody's done. I think it's it's a combination of, of this and the fact that you know um, the efficiency is still only about now past ten percent. I think it's probably a combination of the two. But I know uh, my friend Gary Zamani, who is, does intellectual property on the side and talks with, and also has photovoltaic research as part of his portfolio in his physics life. Uh, so Gergay uh, looks at the photovoltaics and talks with venture capitalists and so on about that. And the biggest concern is the stability. The biggest concern for anything outside of silicon is the stability, basically. So um, uh, that's certainly true as far as I understand it, as, as well as the organic photovoltaics that we'll be hearing about a lot starting tomorrow. But given the low cost, is it important to have that long you know, stability, long-term stability? Now, I would even think that if it sounds like that kind of value yeah. That make it doesn't make sense to keep them you know, during the winter, for example, in Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. rather deep place every spring. And, uh, oh yeah. So, so, so of course they are rather really cheap. 
Well, yeah, I mean, if you bring the, if you, if you have already, if, if the cost system that DeGrasse produced is accurate, then they're already, if, if you could produce them on a mass scale, they're already competitive at that cost level with the existing silicon photovoltaics. Um, but that's slightly tricky because that cost level for the existing silicon photovoltaics folds, per kilowatt hour folds in, I mean, that's the production cost, but for kilowatt hour, that folds in the lifetime of the photovoltaics. So if you have one quarter of the lifetime, then you're, you're completely even on the cost. But, you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it is nice, it's low temperature processing, and, and uh, it should, should be quite good, quite much better environmentally. Um, yeah? Uh, how long time do you want it to be stable for? Is it like 10 years or 40 years? Because well, I think if you could hit, if you could, I mean, it's, it's a trade, just what Yvonne was saying, I think it's a trade off of the cost. If you can make, I mean, the whole thing with plastic photovoltaics, I think, is if you can really make them cheap enough, then presumably you don't care if they don't last as long. Because yeah, you just yeah. you just take them off every year or something like that. Yeah, but you have to replace them. That will introduce some costs. Well. There's some cost to replace, but yeah. Only yeah. Like but years. you know, so presumably, uh, you know, I mean, if you could if you could make it, say, I mean, right now, some of the photovoltaics out there are probably good for 40 years. But if you could make this probably five years, that that would probably be. Uh, that's just me shooting off the top of my head. But it sounds reasonable. If you could make them last for five years, then they'd probably be much more taken much more seriously, given that they already have some low costs. Uh, of, of production built into them. I mean, there's some other concerns. I mean, if you stay with, uh, in, in the Coomerin paper, for example, what they used for the counter electrode was gold based, so a gold covered counter electrode. And if you look at the original uh, Gratzel paper, it's platinum covered counter electrode. So, you know, there are concerns about costs uh, there as well on the electrodes that aren't dissimilar to uh, the concerns about fuel cells. You're not going to, you're not going to make a whole bunch of, even if it's, if it's a thin layer of gold or a thin layer of platinum, you're not going to make a whole bunch of those. You know, so um, there are some concerns about what you do with counter electro too, but I assume that's the least of the problems uh, at the moment. How about the uh, toxicity of the dyes? Um, at least the claim is that, well, certainly the coumarins I think aren't aren't, aren't too bad, but uh, I don't, you know I don't know about toxicity studies on the original the original dyes. Um, that's a good question. Okay, um, right, for further questions, let's thank uh, Professor Cox. <laughs> Come back in uh, 10 minutes' time. That'll be 